Hi, I'm Bill, featherweight guy. Um, this is the Singer Model 12 from 1886 that's uh, advertised on my online store. And this one is actually another one that we own uh, from 1883. It's uh, also a Model 12. Um, just wanted to show you the difference in cases. In 1883, they were using this box style case, which is kind of kind of neat. The door on the end hinges open and then the case slides off uh, in a groove that catches the groove on the edge of the base, which is kind of nice. And this particular Model 12, um, the decals are not as good as this one. I originally, when we acquired this one, my plan was to restore it and sell this one because uh, the one that uh, is in this Bentwood case actually has much nicer decals. But after we've uh, thought about it, we kind of like this earlier style case. And even though the, the machine uh, doesn't look quite as pristine, uh, it's a cooler, in my opinion, early model with this style case. So we've got, we're going to keep this one and, and decide to sell that one. So let me set this one aside and we'll open up the, um, the 1886. So I did a little looking online and I was not able to find out exactly when Singer introduced the Bentwood case, but clearly sometime between 1883 and 1886, but I don't know which year. If any of you know, please drop it in the comments. So this case is very nice. Uh, it was actually broken when I got it. Uh, this end piece uh, had wood missing and it was sprung out. I had to do a lot of repair. And there's actually a place where somebody must have dropped something heavy on here. So there's a little bit of damage in the top that's been repaired quite well actually but if you look closely there is a there is a spot there and on the inside it's got this nice cubby compartment that you can use to store accessories or sewing notions or whatnot so that that's the case but let's uh let's take a look at this machine <clears throat> it's actually kind of small just for comparison here's a here's a model 301 a modern much more modern machine and you can see that the 12 is actually kind of compact. Um, it is not lightweight. The Singer Featherweight weighs 11 pounds. The 301 that I just took off the table is a 16 pound machine. This baby weighs 30 pounds. So even though it's got a handle on the top of the carry case, it is not something you're going to want to carry around the house. Uh, it's certainly pretty heavy. But um, anyway, to, to use this thing, first thing you have to do is fold up the uh, crank handle. This is an original Singer crank handle. Uh, a lot of the hand crank machines that you see nowadays, people have bought a cheap uh, Chinese made uh, attachment that does hand crank. But this is a this is a Singer original. It's actually kind of nice because you can flip this little lever out and that disengages the hand crank then it won't won't do anything which is how you convert it to treadle power. So um, it's set up to be Put on a treadle, you drop these little uh, fold down tabs and those fit into holes in the base of a Singer treadle cabinet so it would be in exactly the right position and the holes are already drilled for the belt that would come up from the flywheel on the treadle and go around the hand wheel and then you could power it that way but this is a this is set up to do hand crank let me re-engage that and now it's now it's in crank mode um, so I'm going to I'm going to uh, show you first how we wind a bobbin which is kind of neat on this and then we'll do a little bit of stitching. So bear with me. I want to start by just showing you the uh, various parts of the machine. Um, this is the bobbin winder assembly. It's kind of nice. You lift this little lever here and that brings it in and engages it against the hand wheel. And as the bobbin fills up this lever would pop when the knee, when you're winding the bobbin would eventually fill and that spring-loaded thing um, senses the the bobbin being full and it and it releases from the um, hand wheel which is really kind of clever so we're going to wind a bobbin in a moment here's your stitch length regulator you would you loosen the screw and you slide it back and forth um, and there's no numbers it doesn't indicate the stitches per inch or anything that's where the serial number is so there there is the Serial number, that's how I knew it was an 1884 machine. There are two spool pins, and I don't know why, because, uh, you know, you only need one, uh, but it, it has two. In fact, both of our Model 12s have two of those spool pins. 
maybe somebody knows the reason for that. Um, the uh, presser foot lifter lever is in the back, just like on a modern machine. The um, on the front here, this uh, when you thread the needle, um, you come across, and uh, the tension discs are actually on the front. They are they are right here. This is the tension assembly, and this screw here is how you adjust the tension. Of course, there's no numbers. You do that by by test stitching and and adjusting one way or the other to get it just right. This adjustment is for the pressure on the presser foot, much like on a modern machine. And then there's actually an adjustment screw here, and you can move this little top piece up or down, which actually changes the position of this lifter arm. And that, that was a trial and error thing to get that in the right spot. So uh, presumably nobody would have to adjust that again. Um, and then these are the slide covers to access the um, the shuttle and the shuttle is right here and the bobbin fits inside there it's a spring-loaded assembly okay so let's wind a bobbin this is again this is what the bobbins look like and if you see there's a little notch on one end of the bobbin and that actually engages there's a there's a spot on here so that it will act as a positive uh, engagement so we're going to put this in and there's a spring, you pull out this spring-loaded thing on this end, and now our bobbin is firmly mounted in there. So we can take a spool of thread and put it up here on the spool pin. And what we do to, uh, is we take the thread and we go under this spring and down, and then underneath the back of the bobbin winder and come back up. And I'll show you why in a minute. It took me a it wasn't obvious why to do that, but after I used it, I realized what a clever idea it was. And then we get a couple of wraps around here just to get it started, which is the tricky part. Uh, if you've got big fingers like I do, it can be a little awkward. All right, so there we are. Got it started around here. I'm going to give it one more wrap. So once you have that set up, we're going we're gonna, to... There's a stop motion knob on the back. We're going to release that. That means when I crank the hand wheel, we're not running the whole machine here, only the bobbin winder. And we will lift this up to engage it. And now we are engaged. And as I turn the crank, the bobbin will begin to wind. And I'm going to trim off this little tail here. And here's the clever part. You actually put your finger on the back and you go back and forth. This is how you guide the thread onto the spool here is with your finger on the back of this assembly. That's why they give you plenty of, that's why this is way up here. It's going through the tension spring to provide enough tension so you get a, a nice wind on here, but you got room to run your finger on the back here and guide the thread across that bobbin. So I can speed up here and um, wind the bobbin. I uh, The owner's manual is kind of interesting. It says to, when you wind the bobbin, to get it fairly evenly, but they want it, quote, a trifle higher on the ends than in the center, which I thought is kind of nice. So um, I'm going to, I'm not going to fill this bobbin all the way. That's plenty for our demonstration purposes. So I'm going to stop there with the bobbin winder. Just cut that. We just take the bobbin out and we've, we've now disengaged. I'll put the stop motion uh, back in so that the machine now engages, okay? And then the next critical step here is to take this bobbin and put it into the shuttle. This is the shuttle. And um, if you look closely, you'll see there's a series of holes on here. And that is actually what you use to get the tension on the thread. What they say is to um, try experimenting based on the thread you're using uh, with putting it in a different number of holes to adjust the tension. So I've now put the, the bobbin into the shuttle. I'm going to run the thread out through one of the holes. And I have found in my trial and error that going through three holes seems to be about right. We'll go through one hole and then back in. Doesn't matter which hole. You're just trying to create a little bit of a friction in the path of the thread. And that's how it that's how it gets the tension. 
Then I'm going to come back out another hole. So now I've gone through a total of three holes, and then the last step is to go underneath this spring. And again, I'm, I'm kind of clumsy here, but there we go. So now the thread is under the spring. That is a fully loaded and ready to go shuttle. Okay, so now we're gonna take our shuttle and you can see that on the shuttle, there is, a, there is a kind of a notch in one end and that notch is gonna engage on the spot right here on the, on the end of the shuttle carrier. So the carrier, if I turn the crank, you'll see the carrier go back and forth. And that is, uh, we gotta turn the crank and get the carrier to the end and we will drop the shuttle in just like that and then we can put the slide plate back on and i'm going to leave that slide plate open just to leave the tail of the thread we'll catch that in a moment okay our next step is going to be to thread the machine so uh, we're going to take the thread across there's a um, place there it comes down and around our tension discs it's actually got to go between the two tension discs and again there's no release on that and then we're going to come up and through the lifter arm. And then we're going to go back down to the needle. There's a, there's a, uh, a thread guide right at the top of the needle clamp. And then we're ready to go through the needle. So, okay. So now we are all threaded and ready to stitch. Okay, I'm just going to use a piece of blue shop towel because with the yellow thread, you'll be able to see the stitches pretty well against the blue. So I folded it in half. We'll put it under here and lower the, lower the lever. And here we go. And I'm going to show you what we've got here. Whoops, got to get the needle to the top. Other than the fact that the thread, my tail of the thread was caught in the stitches, I'll pull that out. And you can see that we actually have a very nice stitch, both top and bottom. So that, you know, this is the miracle that made this so popular. People couldn't believe how well a machine could produce a stitch back in the 1880s. And if you had been sewing garments by hand, which is what everybody had been doing up until that time, uh, you would have been blown away at the efficiency with which you could suddenly sew. So that's kind of the miracle of the sewing machine, and this is the machine that made that possible. So thank you for watching.